Thank you very much for having me today. So my name is Dan, and today we're going to talk about a little bit about Kubernetes. Um, I've got 20 minutes. The original talk was 40 to an hour. We have plenty of demos and, and, and stuff, so I had to cram everything into, into 20 minutes, which means, yeah, we, I'm go I have a demo. Hopefully it works, um, but it's, it's a much shorter version than what I usually run. Okay, who am I? My name is Daniele, very hard to pronounce, so people call me Dan, Daniele, whatever, and people make fun of me because I do quite a lot of Kubernetes, so they shorten my name to D5E. Um, that's me. Um, I, I spoke at KubeCon twice. Um, I'm a certified, oops, that's uh, very quick. I'm not sure why, what's going on. I'm a certified Kubernetes administrator, so I spent, I spent quite a lot of time um, just researching and playing with, with Kubernetes. That's, that's also part of my job. Um, I work for a company called Learn Kubernetes. Um, that's it. They basically teach Kubernetes, and that's why I spend, I spend a lot of time with it. And today, the talk of today is basically we have these Kubernetes clusters. How do we connect them together um, if they are in different regions, in different cloud providers? Now, before we tackle this, this challenge, it, it's worth doing a very short recap of how Kubernetes works. So generally with Kubernetes, what we do as, as developers or just you know, someone interested in deploying, we have like a single unit and we say, hey, Kubernetes, please deploy some, deploy some workloads for me. That, that's basically how it works. We don't really care what's happening under the hood. I mean, most of the time we don't. But in reality, what happens is Kubernetes will basically figure out where these deployments need to be placed inside your infrastructure. So we don't care, but Kubernetes does, because we still have to rely on servers, and we still have to rely on machines deploying these workloads. OK, all good so far. What's next? So Kubernetes, the way the way uh, decides how to place these workloads is decided by what we call the control plane. And the control plane is, is basically a collection of uh, different controllers that work in tandem, that work, work together. And most of the time, there are four big blocks. I mean, there are way more than four, but we are interested in four of them, which are the um, API server, which ingests your requests. And then we've got a database called etcd. Then we've got a controller manager, which is the brain of the operation. And then we've got the scheduler, which basically assigns workloads to nodes. That's, that's the basic thread. So what happens when you deploy an application in Kubernetes? Well, that, that request, you say, I want to deploy something. That request goes inside the API server, goes through a, a, a several steps of authorization, authentication, and just changing also uh, the request on the fly. And then eventually, it gets stored in, in the database, in etcd. Once it's inside etcd, then it's picked up by what we call the controller manager. The controller manager is one of these systems that basically just syncs the state. So if you ask for something, it's going to check that you got what you asked for. In this case, it's asked for the deployment. The controller manager notices that there are four miss, three missing pods, and it's going to create them. Oops. Very, very quick. I'm not sure what's going on. So these pods are created. They are creating and pending inside the database. Those are, they are written down to disk. And then since they're pending, the scheduler is notified of the change, and it will pick them up and then try to allocate those workloads to particular nodes. Right. That's basically the end of, of, um, um, of, of the scheduling of, for these workloads. What's important to notice is that at this point in time, all you've done is basically just changing values inside the database. There is nothing actually going on inside your infrastructure. Right. So who, who creates this workload inside, inside your servers? Well, we need something which is going to do the work, and that something is called the kubelet. So the kubelet is basically like an agent that lives inside your nodes, and they basically what it does is just pulls down all sort of information about the node, right? And try, tries to reconcile the state of the node with, with the control plane. And if there is a workload, then it's going to create it, right? Or if there is a request to delete that workload, then it's also going to delete, delete it. Whoa! <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Not very trustworthy. Okay, so we got we got this cube. We got we got the cube leg. We we know how the control plane works. Um, another thing that it's important to mention, oops, is is that the traffic does not flow through the control plane. 
So when, when you deploy these applications, these applications are serving web traffic, like production traffic, then this is not the kind of scenario we, we are looking at. Oh, I'm not sure what's going on, so I'm going to stick to... The Zillius is on my clicker. Yeah, yeah sure. Sure, that's a good idea. Um, so what, what's going on is, is that um, the traffic doesn't, doesn't flow like this. Instead of what we see is um, most of the time the traffic flows directly through the nodes. And these nodes are fronted by a load balancer. And then what basically means is that this, this control plane could go down and we can still serve traffic, right? Which is quite, quite convenient for us, right? Um, and this, now we know the basics, let's, let's have a look at how the basics apply when we, when we scale this cluster from, from one single region, so one single cluster to multiple clusters, right? So the first idea is, okay, I've got, I've got an application, I've got an e-commerce website or a financial application that needs to be deployed into different regions for availability, for example. So one, you know, the first idea you might have is, okay, I'm going to have a single control plane and then several nodes spread across regions. That's perfectly fine. Um, there is, um, you know, all, of you, all the traffic, will, of course, will be ingested by the nodes, which is great. Uh, but the reality is that some of the communication that you have between the control plane and the rest of the nodes will be slow, right? Because, of course, they're in different regions. You might say, okay, that's, you know, I can, I can bear the costs, I can bear the trade-offs. Let's do this. Then the same sort of problem you will sort of face when you deploy your applications, right? Because Kubernetes treats those nodes as equals, right? So it's going to deploy, you're going to deploy these microservices, and then they start talking to each other, right? So you might have cases where some of the traffic which is distributed inside the cluster is a little bit slower because Kubernetes essentially doesn't, doesn't know that this traffic is going to be redirected somewhere else. Now, there are changes in the Kubernetes API to make it that a little bit better, but by but, but default, this is what you get, which is, you know, sometimes everything works fine, and then suddenly everything is super slow. Okay, so how do we fix this? Well, what if, right, we use one of these Kubernetes features to, to fix it? So instead of having a single control plane, right, Kubernetes can be designed, can be deployed to have multiple control planes. So the idea is, if I can have multiple control planes, and each control plane has got a database, and all these databases synchronize between each other, but who is stopping me from deploying multiple control planes, and then eventually one for each region that I'm, that, I'm, that, I'm, that I'm using in my infrastructure? No one is stopping me. I can do that. Does it solve the problem that we had before? Well, sort of yes, because these nodes, they can talk directly to, to to the control plane in the same region, so that sort of communication should be solved. However, this introduces another issue, which is, which is replication, right? So we talked about how this database needs to be replicated between, um, uh, between instances, and the issue is that the database will write to disk only for its quorum, right? So if the, if the majority of the nodes agree on a value. In this particular case, it will take ages to agree on value because they are in different regions and latency is very high. So this design is even worse than what we had before. Um, so we know we, can, we can't really do um, a, a single cluster with multiple, with multiple nodes in multiple regions. We know it's very tricky to do a single, uh, a single cluster with multiple control planes and multiple nodes in multiple regions. So what can we do? Well, the reality is that we can have a single cluster per region. And that's that generally the better approach that, that you might take when designing this sort of stuff. However, when, when we do this, there are a few issues. The first issue is how do we decide how to place these workloads, in, in which cluster we're going to place these workloads? This is issue number one. Second issue is if I route the traffic to the US cluster or the EU cluster or the South Asia Pacific, Pacific cluster and there is no app or it's overloaded, how do I route the traffic to the other clusters, right? And, and third one is, if I've got storage in one cluster and that application needs to move, do I need to move the, the storage on the other cluster as well? I don't know. So uh, when I played with, with this sort of um, examples, then, then I, found, I found a quite uh, interesting tool called Kermada. And basically the way it works is it's an orchestrator of, of clusters. And, and you install a cluster, you install this, this software in one cluster, which becomes the manager, and then the rest of your cluster will become workers. 
And the way Kermada works is basically we just send the request to the manager and the manager will basically distribute these workloads across, across the entire fleet. And why was it, is it good? It is quite good. I think it's quite clever in a way. It basically creates a mirror of your control plane, but this control plane is basically cluster aware. So it's aware that there are several other clusters and they need to be orchestrated. And, and what happens is you have an agent which is similar to the Kubelet in a way, and then it's the agent which is basically gonna send the commands to the individual cluster. So you have a single cluster which basically sends all of these commands to the agent and the agent will send the commands to the cluster themselves. Um, so that's basically how it works, but the interesting thing is this Kermada, which is basically a, a glorified control plane for clusters, can have something called policies. So you can basically say, I want to create a deployment and I want to go to just the US, the US deployment, the US cluster. So if you do that and you submit the policy, we'll basically have a deployment just in the US. If I go back to my policy and I change it to the EU, so to Europe, then this pod will be moved to Europe, right? And there are also many other ways to describe how you want the state of the cluster to be. In this particular case, I say, I want to deploy two pods, and if I say duplicated, then Kamada will deploy two for each cluster I've got in my fleet. Or I could say something like divided, you know, I could, I could put different weights, or I can say aggregated, so filling one cluster first and then move on to the next one. And then there are way, way more ways to, to configure however you want this to be to, to look like. This is all good, and when you deploy Kamada, the networking for Kamada is isolated to the, to the cluster itself, which basically means that if the traffic is rooted inside um, South Asia Pacific, so in Singapore, then it stays in Singapore. There is no way to share this traffic with the rest of the clusters. So what do we do? I want, I want to be able to share this data, I want to be able to share this traffic with, with the rest of the fleet. Um, I can do that if, if somehow I find a way to share this IP address and this information about workloads that have been deployed in my infrastructure. And the way we do this is basically by intercepting the traffic proxying it to the other cluster and then rewriting it when we are on the other side. And to do that, we use something called service meshes. So one, one way to solve it, it's not the only way, but one way to solve it is, is to use something like service meshes. So you might have heard this name, um, so Istio, which is what I use in, in the tool as well. So what, what are these service meshes and how they work? So essentially you have services, you have deployments inside your cluster and then they all talk to each other. So when you install the service mesh, what happens is each of these applications will be fronted by a proxy. So all incoming and outgoing traffic will be filtered by the proxy. But this proxy is not just like a regular you know, NGINX proxy. It's actually a programmable proxy that can be reconfigured on the fly. So the way it works is we've got another control plane, which is the Istio control plane, which on the fly will basically reconfigure the routes and the endpoints for these, for these proxies, which gives us quite, quite a lot of flexibility for saying, oh, I changed my mind, I don't want these two services to talk to each other anymore, or I could say something like, hey, when you do the load balancing, can you please do a different split than 50-50 or round robin? Right? All this information is something we ask, we send to the control plane, the control plane will reconfigure these proxies on the fly. Um, so that's, that's how it works. What can we do with this? Well, if we can reconfigure on the fly, we could also say, hey, this traffic, we also have multiple pods in multiple clusters, so route this traffic somewhere else. And that somewhere else is, is basically um, the service mesh. So this is basically the, how the service mesh multi-cluster works. So we've got cluster one and cluster two. And then what, when we install Istio, you can see the proxy there, the programmable proxy becomes part of your application. It's a single unit. And then when you, when you install what we call the gateway, which is basically a way to connect these two, serve, these two clusters together, and then Istio will basically start sharing and discovering endpoints from the other clusters, right? So this is basically where we share, this is my workload, this is yours, you know, and we keep this information um, in, in the cluster. Now, when the traffic comes in and it goes to the proxy, then we have the ability to say, actually, you know what? 
I will send this through the gateway to the other side. And that's basically how we share, um, we share the traffic. So what does it look like? So we've got a deployment. We know we can spread this pod across the cluster. Um, we know we have policy. We can decide how to, how, how to spread it in, in, in our fleet. And now we have this service mesh, which is also able to decide where the traffic should be placed. Now, we've done, we've done something basic. We just basically install the service mesh and connect to the cluster. But we can also do clever things such as always send the traffic to the local cluster. And if you're overloaded, go somewhere else. Right. So in this particular case, it's just, just a basic configuration. But at the end, we are basically able to ingest traffic in one cluster, and then if we want to, forward it to the others. Do you believe me? Someone saying no. No. Anyone else? Okay, I've got four minutes to make it work. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what I've got, um, hopefully it works. So what, what I have is a small, a small script, and, and what it does is basically just um, send the request to the cluster and see, and, and, and basically check the response. Now, hopefully the Wi-Fi works. I have no clue what's going on or how slow it is. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll wait a little bit longer. Okay, um, so this is a dashboard I, I built. So this is, I, I deployed three clusters today. Um, before I came, this is why I was late. <laughs> I managed to, to, <laughs> to just deploy the cluster. But what, what this dashboard is, is basically just pulling the data from the three clusters I've done. And then the, 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 what, what happens is I've got here um, some, some radio buttons at the top where I can select where the traffic is going. So I make a request to the London cluster, or I make a request to the US cluster. And then I, I basically have a small application that replies with, <laughs> let me see if, if the script works. No, of course not. That replies with uh, <laughs> a flag with, with the region where the cluster is deployed. So this, you can see here that when I send the traffic to the US, it takes ages, but most of the time it goes to the US and now it's going to London. Right, so I send the request to the cluster in the US, it travels all the way to London, and then it comes back. Right? And if I switch to, to Singapore, then it goes to Singapore, and then it goes back to London, and, and then it comes back. So, so basically, this is Istio deciding that some of the endpoints that we've got inside our cluster needs to be routed elsewhere before they go back uh, as a response. Um, here we go. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. So, two minutes. Let me wrap up. Um, so, I, I think so. What we what we discussed today. So, uh, we we had a look at how can Kubernetes works. So that was important. So, so we now understand how scheduling works in Kamada. So, how do we manage to have policies that can spread cluster, can spread uh, workloads across clusters? We had a look at how you know different options that we have to deploy Kubernetes. Um, so we could have a single control plane, multiple nodes in multiple regions, but we sort of discovered that the better way to do it, sort of easier way to do it, um, is, is to have a single cluster per region. Um, we had a look at Kamada, so this tool, I mean, it's not the only tool that does this. You, so some of you might have used uh, Argo CD um, to do deployments to the multiple clusters. Perfectly valid option. I was just interested in, in this one for, uh, for my, my research. Um, we sort of had a look at how um, Istio shares IP addresses between clusters and, um, and how this traffic is forwarded in, in the network using, using gateways. We also had a look at the demo, and it actually worked this time, which is uh, excellent news. So I just want to <laughs> thank you, everyone, for, for joining me today. Um, this is me. I don't know how much time I've got. Um, maybe 30 seconds for questions. Uh, one is Linkerd, which is the second most popular service mesh, and then the third one is called Kuma from from the um, Kong Kong guys. Um, yeah, I think but yeah, those are those are the most popular, I guess. But there are many more options.
So, so the question is, why do I need multiple, multiple control planes? Uh, so the reason why you need multiple control planes is because Kubernetes um, stores what we call endpoints. So endpoint is basically the IP address of the pod. And that IP address of the pod is used by several, several components in the cluster. So the components are core DNS, so the DNS system, the ingress. And what they do is they basically make an API request to the control plane and say, can I have back a list of nodes, please? With this list of, list of IP addresses, please. With this list of IP addresses, they basically reconfigure on the fly the DNS, the ingress, and several other components to make the cluster work. So when, when you grab a control plane and you shut it down, if you don't do anything at all, your cluster will work. But as soon as you have the new workload, then first of all, I don't know how you're gonna schedule that workload, but assuming that one of your workloads goes down, and that IP address is not available anymore, there is no way to update the control plane saying, hey, this IP address is gone. So your DNS, your ingress will still have a, a stale list of IP addresses that will still route traffic to those, even if you don't want to. Now, this is not great, this is <laughs> but your cluster still works. So you don't have 100% downtime. You will have, <laughs> depending on what's going on, you will have degraded service. But, but it's not like fully percent, you know, 100 percent downtime. So yes, we want have we want to have multiple control planes because we want to make sure that these endpoints are propagated correctly. Um, but again, it's it's trade-offs. Um, it goes back to how etcd works and how replication in databases work. So add, the more the more a control plane you add, the slower it gets, and there are consequences to that. Okay. Uh, this is the last talk before lunch. And so <laughs> those of you who want to go to lunch, I would say go ahead. But uh, if you're game to stick around. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I am. Uh, I think Google Antos is a collection collection of, of tools. Kamada is just like open source tool focused on, on scheduling. And you know multiple cluster. I think I'm not I'm not an expert in Antos by any way, um, but I think Antos is is a is way more unified collection of tools that help help you to deploy Kubernetes on on prem or in the cloud. So I think you know you can have Istio in Antos. That's for sure. Um, I don't know how you would do multi cluster. I'm pretty sure Google has got like a a load balancer that can distribute traffic across multiple clusters, that's, that's for sure. Um, so I think they are quite different, as in, you know, different, different sort of mm, aim for, for the project. Cool. Any other question? I guess the question is, where is lunch? Um, it's basically just a collection of tools, like you, in the same way you would install Prometheus, or you stay, the same way you would install Istio, then you install this in one cluster, and that cluster become, becomes the cluster manager, will basically become like this, this entity that can manage other clusters. And then, it's a little bit weird, because then your kubectl, then the same cluster will have two, two kubectls, right? two kube configs. One for the normal cluster, then if you do kubectl get pods, you will see Karmada, and then there is the Karmada kubectl, same kubectl, different kube config. And if you do kubectl get deployments, it, show you the de it shows you the deployment across clusters, which is like a control plane for the entire fleet you've got. And, and basically, Karmada, what it does, it basically aggregates all of the, all of the kube config from all of the other uh, clusters, which is quite cool, right? You see a unified view of whatever is, go is going on in, in your fleet. Yeah, it's it's on top. It, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, all of the code for the demo is open source and it's online. Um, so I can share I can share the the GitHub repo. Not not an issue at all. Um, yeah, but this this sort of stuff breaks quite easily. So I spent this morning <laughs> fixing. <laughs> As you can imagine, there are so many moving moving parts. <laughs> I was like, okay, can I do it? No. Can I do it? Maybe. <laughs> and then eventually I, I figure out how to do how to fix it. <laughs> cool.
I don't, I don't think that's, that's the case because the, the service mesh will basically do that work for you. So I, I think there are like several ways you can connect multiple clusters together. And then some of those will be like similar to what we do in, in AWS, like VPC peering, where you need to be careful about how you assign IP addresses. Like an example of that, I think, I'm not, I never use it, but I think it's called, it's a product called Celium Service Mesh. So this, this will be like a lower level. So we're talking about probably L2 for connecting clusters, right? And then Istio sits at the very, <laughs> very top, right? Uh, most of the time, layer seven. Um, so so in, that, in that particular case, we don't need any, any precaution when it comes to networking. But <laughs> there are consequences on, on running a lot of proxies in your cluster when it comes to yeah, managing them, resources. It, it is not free. It is not free for sure. Um, but but it, is, it is an option if, you, if, you, if you've got these kind of problems. Cool. No one is asking where lunch is. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>